Welcome back to part two of my CISSP exam cram series. And today we're covering domain two, which is asset security on our continuing mission to help you get further faster in your CISSP exam prep. A lot to cover in a short time, so let's get after it. So welcome to CISSP exam cram lesson two, which covers domain two which is asset security. So the asset security domain is fairly small, but there are some critical concepts you're going to need to be very familiar with for the exam. So let's get right into the official CISSP exam outline and, and pick this apart and understand where we need to focus. Uh, information and asset classification is listed in this domain. Information and asset ownership. Now in the area of ownership, I think there are two roles that are going to be key for the exam and I'll break those out, but understanding we do need to study and know all the roles, but there too, I think, are almost certainly going to come up on the exam. Uh, protecting privacy falls into this section, as does asset retention, and with uh, asset reten retention uh, comes also data destruction, and we'll talk about why getting rid of records when we no longer need them is important. You're expected to understand how to determine appropriate data security controls, and Establishing information and asset handling requirements, which means labeling, marking, and chain of custody. You've probably heard of, of chain of custody on a detective show because chain of custody is important in evidence handling. So we'll touch on that one as well. So in this series, again, we're on part two, which is this video. This is an eight-part series, so essentially one lesson per exam domain, and I'll have five to ten sort of breakout lessons to cover some some topics that require deep memorization or tend to be problematic for folks. And we've already got one of those out there, and that's the uh, Hack Your CISSP exam prep. So that covers how I prepared for the CISSP exam uh, in a minimal amount of time. And hopefully you'll find some tips in there that will help you prepare uh, more effectively and efficiently and more quickly, uh, just as important. If you're using the official study guide, Domain 2 is covered in Chapter 5, which is Protecting Security of Assets. And you can get the guide over on Amazon.com. I have a link in the video description to the least expensive uh, version I could find. Remember, lots of practice questions and flashcards there that will be very helpful to you. Uh, speaking about free resources, I have a 50-question CISSP practice quiz. If you haven't yet bought the guide and you'd like to just assess your your current state, uh, go over and check that out. It doesn't require a login. Uh, I have a link in the video description. So let's start with data security control. So marking, labeling, handling, and classification uh, may well come up on the exam, classification being the most important of these. And we'll talk about data classifications in just a moment. Uh, data handling, shipping, chain of custody, you know, remembering you know, don't open boxes. And with data retention comes data destruction. We'll talk through some data re destruction methods like erasing, clearing, overwriting, uh, more on that in a moment. And with record retention, uh, we always need to remember that, that data destruction. If the retention policy is one year, that data should be destroyed when it ages out. So when it ages beyond one year. Uh, you may even see something related to tape backup. This, you know, this feels like a legacy concept, but it may come up because it exists in the real world. And, and tape backup security, having a secure facility, tapes labeled will ensure that you know, everybody understands the classification of the data, which really kind of comes back to that first concept of marking, labeling, and, and handling. So let's talk about data destruction methods. And you'll definitely want to understand the difference between these. So at, at a basic level, erasing data, uh, which is just performing a delete operation. So with erasing, you'll want to remember that data is typically recoverable using traditional data recovery tools. Now clearing or overriding prepares media for reuse and ensures that data cannot be recovered using traditional recovery tools. So purging is a more intense form of clearing, and it's used in less secure environments. So why do I highlight less secure environments? That's because, for example, the U.S. government doesn't consider any form of purging as an acceptable data destruction method for top secret data. Degaussing 
uh, is a process that uses a device called a degausser to create a strong magnetic field that erases data on, on some media, so, so physical media, obviously. And then destruction is the final stage in the life cycle of media, and it's the most secure method of sanitizing data. Methods of data destruction include uh, operations like incineration, crushing, shredding, uh, dissolving using a, a caustic or, or acid, acidic compound. And before we step away from data security controls, I want to mention one other concept, which is a security control baseline, which provides, uh, according to the, the CISSP exam guide, a listing of controls that an organization can apply as a baseline. So listing of controls and a baseline that feels a little repetitive. Another way I might say this is a baseline is a group of controls that can be applied as a, a base standard or a starting point that we work from. Not unlike a configuration baseline that you'd uh, work with as a starting point for securing your endpoints, for example. So for the exam, uh, do be familiar with record retention and data destruction. I mentioned that you know, keeping data around for longer than necessary can, can be a problem. Uh, what it can do is present unnecessary legal issues. And in fact, if memory serves, the CISSP exam prep guide outlines a story with, uh, with a big uh, aeronautical company that uh, had a big lawsuit uh, that they settled for a lot more money than necessary because they kept data around for longer than necessary. Is your frontline support struggling with too many Microsoft Cloud portals? Now they can manage Office 365 users and devices directly from Microsoft Teams using... Simon, the AI-powered chatbot for the Microsoft Cloud. A link with more info in the video description. So when it comes to data protection, confidentiality is often protected through encryption. This is mentioned only briefly in Domain 2. This is really more a topic for Domain 3, so we'll cover encryption in Lesson 3. So let's move on to defining sensitive data through data classification. So we're going to look at the four levels of data classification for government or non-government or sometimes called public data. So we have class zero, which in government terms would be unclassified uh, or, or public data. So no damage occurs if this sort of data is revealed outside the organization. Class one, this is data that would be confidential or in the non-government space sensitive. So this is data that could cause damage to the organization if unintentionally disclosed or intentionally disclosed for that matter, but, but disclosed without authorization. So at class two, we have secret data and private data, data that can cause serious damage to the organization if disclosed. And then at the highest level in class three, we have top secret data or confidential or proprietary data in the, uh, the public space, which is data that can cause uh, exceptionally grave damage if revealed. So you'll notice some commonalities here, the word serious and, and then exceptionally grave. So you have these juxtaposed standards for government and non-government. I would be familiar with both of these. Uh, briefly in uh, Domain 3, we'll actually talk about sensitive uh, but unclassified data in uh, when we're talking cryptography. But generally speaking, I think much less likely to come up on the, uh, the exam itself. So when it comes to asset classifications, asset classification should typically match data classifications. And when it comes to sensitive data, there are two types of data you want to be very familiar with. And this is sensitive data that uh, isn't public or unclassified. Uh, there's personally identifiable information or PII data. PII data refers to any information that can identify an individual. So these would be uh, data elements like their name, social security number, uh, birthplace or birth date, biometric records, uh, you know, thumbprints, retina scans. And the other you want to be familiar with is personal health information or PHI. This is health-related information that can be tied back to a specific person. So this would be covered by uh, regulatory standards like HIPAA that we talked about in, in Domain 1. So 
Let's talk about data ownership for a moment. So know these two roles. I think if, if we you know, think about what are the roles most likely to come up on the exam, data owner, which is someone who can delegate some day-to-day -day responsibility for, for data handling and security. And then there's the data custodian. So this is someone who doesn't decide what controls are needed, but they do implement those controls on behalf of the data owner. So just a quick tip, if the question mentions day-to-day, -day, they're typically talking about the duties of the custodian. And another sort of delineating factor here, the data owner is usually a member of senior management. A data custodian is typically going to be somebody in the IT department. So that's another way you can potentially pick out uh, which would be the, the most appropriate answer. So I want to talk to you about some other roles and then GDPR in particular, which, which is you're relatively new in the world uh, of regulatory standards, but I think more and more important all the time because it does apply to a lot of U.S. companies. So let's talk about some of the other roles. So do be prepared to answer questions on some of these other roles. So data administrators responsible for granting appropriate access to personnel, often via uh, role-based access control. A user refers to any person who accesses data via a computing system to accomplish their work tasks. Then we have business or mission owners. And th this role can actually overlap responsibilities with the system owner, or sometimes even be the same role. Uh, and then finally, asset owners. This is the person who owns the asset or the system that processes sensitive data and the associated security plans. And I think the key there is associated security plans. Uh, so let's talk about GDPR because GDPR calls out some specific terminology relative to GDPR and they treat uh, one or two terms a little bit differently than you'll see elsewhere. So definitely know your GDPR terminology and requirements. I think this is quite likely to come up on the exam. So GDPR defines a data processor which is the entity that processes data on behalf of a data controller. That data processor can be a person, an authority, an agency, or another body, it's, but it's the person, it's the entity processing the data on behalf of the data controller, who is the person or entity that controls processing of the data. Uh, of the data. And then data transfer. Uh, know that GDPR restricts data transfer to countries outside the EU. Okay, continuing down this road. So there is some discussion in Domain 2 around reducing your GDPR requirements or exposure. So there are a couple of ways you can approach this. The first is anonymization, which is the process of removing all relevant data. So it's impossible to identify the original subject or person. So if done effectively, GDPR is no longer relevant for the anonymized data. Now, it's important to note here uh, the word remove the words removing and impossible because this is only going to be good if you don't need the data because it will be impossible to identify the original subject or person. So I think that's one of the keys if this method comes up on the exam. So if you need the data, there is another way to handle this and that's through pseudonymization. That's a big one, so I'll say it one more time. Pseudonymization, which is the process of using pseudonyms or aliases to represent other data. So you use this in scenarios where you need that information, but you want to mask the identity of the user or subject to which the data belongs. But you definitely need the data. So an example of this would be creating a patient number to tie back to the data, which then masks the, the name of the patient at that point. But bearing in mind that you know, this will potentially reduce your uh, exposure. It will result in less stringent requirements than otherwise would apply under GDPR. But bearing in mind that if that pseudonym is ever revealed, if that patient number is ever uh, tied back and revealed uh, to the patient name, then the pseudonym is no longer effective. The, the alias doesn't work anymore. So it's a great concept, but execution matters is my point. Uh, so if you, but, you, but if you need the data and you want to reduce exposure, Pseudonymization is going to be the method you'll use versus anonymization. But for the exam, uh, I would definitely be familiar with the GDPR terminology and security controls. This standard is front and center uh, in, in business today because it applies not only to the EU, but any country, any, any country that does business with customers in the EU, which means it can apply to U.S. Uh, companies. 
second. I mentioned domain two is a short but important domain and that does it. So do be sure to memorize the concepts we talked about here. They'll come up on the exam. You need to pass this domain to pass the exam as a whole. And be sure to subscribe, hit the notification bell and give us a like if this is helping you out. So you get a heads up when we drop domain three. In the meantime, be well, stay safe, and we'll see you in the next one.